determine success in Pakistan. Failure in Afghanistan does not predetermine failure in Pakistan. It contributes to aids and abets makes worse the, prog the, the prognosis for the outcome of the war ongoing in Pakistan. It does not predetermine it. This creates a fairly nasty policy conundrum for the government in Washington. We have important interests at stake in Afghanistan, but they're indirect and they're limited in scale. To pursue them effectively, in my view, requires a major investment of money, soldiers, and sacrifice. Integrated counterinsurgency of the kind proposed by General McChrystal is, in my view, the right way forward if we are going to wage war in Afghanistan. But it is an extremely expensive form of warfare and tends to be prolonged and to cost enormous amounts of money. You might imagine that in a situation where we had important but limited interests, we would like a limited but non-zero conduct of war. The problem is it doesn't work very well in the context of the kind of war that's being waged in Afghanistan now. For reasons we can pick up in Q&A if you like, it is very popular to propose middle way options that seem better suited to the real but limited interests at stake in Afghanistan. Do away with population defense on the ground and instead rely on drones to do counterterrorism. Train and advise the Afghan military. Don't engage in combat operations within Afghanistan. There are perhaps a half dozen or more of these in-between middle way proposals that have been advanced in the Washington debate. I will simply float as a conclusion that I don't think any of them are likely to be very effective. If we're going to have any reasonable chance of securing the interests we have at stake in Afghanistan, I think we are going to have to contemplate a major investment to get that done. And that's going to be a very, very hard road to hoe politically and not just with the Democratic Party. It's clear that the progressive wing of the Democratic Party is not very happy with the war in Afghanistan. They were probably never very happy with it. For tactical reasons, it was not an argument that was advanced very loudly during the presidential campaign. But it's been clear since the transition that a sizable part of the Democratic Party is dangerously close to withdrawing support from the war. In fact, this is a less partisan issue than it seems at first blush. I've spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill lately, largely because the administration won't. And I can tell you that I have yet to encounter a single Republican staffer on Capitol Hill who likes this war or thinks the prospects are very promising. Their members, Republican elected officials, are for tactical reasons that parallel strikingly, if diametrically opposite, the tactical reasons that the progressive wing of the Democratic Party adopted during the presidential campaign are at the moment maintaining strict party loyalty and support for the war in Afghanistan. But I submit to you that that support is about a millimeter deep. The Republican Party, like the Democratic Party, is divided. It consists at the moment of a significant number of neoconservatives and an also significant number of paleoconservatives. Neoconservatives, as I suspect you have encountered in your studies here at the uh, South Hudson Institute of Technology, are great believers in the importance of ideology in the way countries are governed and in the capacity of the United States to change the way countries are governed. Paleoconservatives, on the other hand, the old-fashioned, gray-haired, small government fiscal conservative kind of conservative, look at counterinsurgency. And they say, counterinsurgency looks a heck of a lot like nation building to me. Nation building looks a heck of a lot like social engineering to me. And social engineering is beyond the capacity of the state. Therefore, this undertaking is, in, is very unlikely to succeed. And as this war goes forward, and as we go through multiple funding cycles on Capitol Hill, 
the odds that the Republican Party whip in the House and the Senate manages to keep the Republican Party together in support of this war, given this degree of underlying discomfort on the part of at least half of the Republicans on Capitol Hill with the undertaking, I suspect, has serious questions that should be asked about it. And I think we could very well face, a few years out, a left-right coalition against the middle on Afghanistan in which progressive Democrats and paleoconservative Republicans both disagree with the degree of sacrifice required for the waging of the war. And what we're left with as a result, it seems to me, is an extraordinarily difficult political circle to square. In which I believe, for a variety of reasons, the Obama administration does not want to leave our interests in Afghanistan undefended and unsecured but is going to find the domestic political problem and challenge of generating the support for the degree of sacrifice required to pursue them effectively very difficult to do. One of the several reasons why I am personally very supportive of the National Security Council's ongoing and apparently endless review of Afghanistan policy is because the challenge for the President of circumventing the dissatisfaction with the war on both ends of the ideological spectrum should not be underestimated. And for a variety of reasons, an extended review, I think, is a political prerequisite for marshalling the degree of domestic political support that will be required to go forward. And my guess is at the end of the day, the administration will decide to go forward. But this is not going to be an easy process. This will be a challenging speech for any speechwriter to write and for any president to give. With, well, on that happy note, uh, why don't I stop there and we, we can go to, to Q&A either on Afghanistan or on Lebanon if, if folks would prefer. I have a microphone here for you in the back. Uh, what do you think the U.S. military can do itself to solve the problem in Afghanistan? Uh, what are we doing correctly or incorrectly, uh, regardless of the situation, to help solve the problem in Afghanistan? Yeah, I, I think that truth in advertising, I, I was part of the assessment team that, that helped write the McChrystal Report, so I'm not a disinterested observer. But I, having said that, I think the McChrystal Report is a reasonable articulation of the highest probability route to successfully securing our interests in Afghanistan. Uh, and I, I happen to think that the US military of today is actually a pretty proficient counterinsurgency instrument. It, it's not perfect, no large organization is, but I think as a result of substantial experience in the school of hard knocks, uh, we are now pretty good at this. And I think what is required of the US military to succeed is that properly resourced, it implement today's doctrine for the conduct of counterinsurgency in a theater like Afghanistan. 